Hello, uh, welcome from Australia. Um, sorry that I couldn't be here, and it's a great pleasure to be invited. Nevertheless, thank you very much. I'll be talking about PGRMC1 and, and its uh, role in some interesting biology. So here's just a schematic of the protein. Just draw your attention to those two uh, tyrosines, which are phosphorylated. It has a cytochrome B5 fold. Uh, it is not related to the progesterone receptor. It's the uh, archetypical member of the membrane-associated progesterone receptor family, or MAPR family, and there are, uh, these have a uh, MAPR interhelical insert region between helices 3 and 4 of the canonical cytochrome B5 that defines the family, and they have also unique uh, tyrosinate heme chelation, and that means that when uh, the heme is reduced, it accepts an electron, it loses affinity for the protein, which leaves sort of a pocket there to do some other interesting stuff. Uh, so we have four MAPR subfamily genes that are there. Okay, I was first interested in this protein uh, when back in Germany in 2008, we found that it was differentially phosphorylated between estrogen receptor positive and negative tumours and that in vitro phosphorylation mutants affected cell viability. We also found, and we can see here, that the estrogen receptor uh, is uh, in an estrogen receptor positive tumour. The estrogen receptor is down-regulated in the hypoxic zone and PGRMC1 is up-regulated there. And this is the uh, necrotic core of the tumour here. So, um, Interestingly, in an adjacent slide, we see that uh, PGRMC1 induction precedes the uh, HIF1A induced hypoxia, uh, uh, hypoxia induced factor 1A, uh, GLUT1 expression glucose transporter. Okay, so uh, we then predicted that PGRMC1 was involved in the Warburg effect. Unfortunately, uh, the Australian grant system didn't believe that that could be. They didn't give me any money, but uh, since then, Saber has basically just uh, confirmed this result in a very nice paper, you should read that. And um, we have similar results, largely on the back of Bashar Adaji, who will, uh, I'll, I'll talk about those. So essentially we have a, a system where we've mutated these two series, uh, which we think are negatively regulatory series, and um, in the context of that, we then also mutate this tyrosine. So the idea is the two series will open up the tyrosine for interaction, but once we destroy that, then it goes again. The wild type protein uh, is, uh, d doesn't change the shape of the parental cells. You can see the sort of fibroblasty looking things. The double mutant, the, the two serines have gone double mutant. Uh, it changes the shape to this rounded shape. And the triple mutant also is a rounded shape, if anything more compact. We can see there we've got the Western block characterization. The model that I'm looking at is uh, three independent stable cell lines for each plasmid. So any differences we see here are not due to cell artifacts, but they're due to the protein themselves. So here we can see a proteomics analysis. Uh, there's the heat map at the top and the pathways map there. And basically these red pathways here sort of look like energy metabolism. And these blue pathways at the, looks, uh, the bottom look like ribosome translation, messenger RNA processing, some chaperone stuff, and things like that. I just draw your attention to two of those pathways, actin cytoskeleton and PI3 kinase, uh, just to show you what's going on. So this is the actin cytoskeleton, half a dozen proteins involved in this. And actually, when we try to verify this with scratch migration assays, we see that uh, double mutant cells indeed have higher activity. Um, the PI3 kinase activity, uh, you can see the proteomics is predicting it to be down in triple mutant. And when we look at uh, BAD or glycogen synthase kinase 3 phosphorylation, uh, both of those are reduced in triple mutant relative to double mutant. So once again, the only difference between those is the oxygen of that tyrosine there. And so we can say that PI3 kinase act requires tyrosine 180. With glucose metabolism, both glucose uptake and lactate secretion follow similar profiles. Um, introduction of the PGRMC1 reduces that. The double mutant uh, consumes much less oxygen, uh, much less um, uh, glucose, and uh, the results are reproducible. So, <clears throat> a very interesting effect on uh, mitochondria. Here we can see in Mia, Paca, and wild type cells that we have this long filamentous type mitochondria and the rounded cells have these short, uh, fragmented, rounding mitochondria. And, uh, yeah, you can read about that elsewhere. The uh, 
We show here that the tyrosine 180 is absolutely required for efficient mouse xenograft subcutaneous tumor formation. Um, so we also involve tyrosine 180 single mutant there. So I'll, the effects on mitochondria prompted me to examine whether uh, PGRMC1 may have been involved in the origin of mitochondria or the origin of eukaryotes. And the system that we're looking at there is at 2.4 billion years ago, photosynthesis had just evolved, it's bacterial photosynthesis, and the methane atmosphere was converted to carbon dioxide and oxygen, which was not blue sky smiling at me, it was very life-threatening, and um, anaerobic proteoeukaryotes, proto which are an Asgard uh, archaeal cell, uh, needed a survival strategy, and that was the recruitment of a bacterial uh, symbiote to detoxify its oxygen. That's a great paper, you can read about that there. So um, that study showed that bacteria that um, there are these cytochrome B5 and YMAP are like proteins that came from bacteria. They have no me here, so this me here is a eukaryotic invention, but they do have uh, they do have uh, tyrosinate heat inculation. So also the system has uh, well all, for, all all of the genes here came from. Uh, bacteria, that is the mevalonate pathway, squalene cyclase, which produces the first sterile lapinosterol, and the cytochrome P51 and PGRMC1, which then modify the first sterile lapinosterol into this uh, FF mass, which is actually a meiosis inducing factor. So that's the possibility that PGRMC1 is involved in a meiosis induction. Uh, the reaction of cytochrome P51 here. And, uh, and PGRMC1 actually interesting because it involves oxygen. So you can imagine that when oxygen's around, this sterile is produced and it does something to save the cells from dying of oxygen stress. The genomic context of bacteria uh, that have this cytochrome B5MY type protein, it's an inducible system, it has a ferric reductase and it has two other cytochrome B5. So, so it's uh, some sort of a redox sensitive system that's induced. One could hazard a guess it's induced in the presence of oxygen. A model how that might work is that this uh, the cytochrome P450 and MAPR protein make a uh, make a lens sterile. PGRMC1 loses its, its uh, heme. The uh, sterile then binds to PGRMC1, and somehow that increases uh, mitochondrial activity and reduces oxygen levels, so the host can survive. Uh, this also could be involved in other stuff, like for instance, PGRMC1 is involved in mitosis, G1 checkpoint, membrane trafficking, and perhaps even the origin of the eukaryotic membrane. So um, what? eukaryotes can do that other kingdoms can't do is pinch vesicles off to the inside. And this involves actin, uh, myosin, cytoskeleton, so you can read about that in, in that review there. But uh, PGRMC1's membrane trafficking could be related to this. And we see that we've got this motif of PGRMC1 here lined up against lots of myosins. Of course, myosin actin, and in the myosin, uh, we see that the protein is uh, that motif is in the coiled coil region. Uh, it's uh, there's actually a slight break in the coiled coil here, and this is the sort of place where proteins are expected to be able to interact with those uh, loose amino acids there. And in PGRMC1, you've got this short coiled coil and then a break, and uh, so potentially myosins in PGRMC1 could be interacting with the same thing. Uh, it sort of reeks like uh, smells like something. So skeleton. Um, the tyrosine is actually, uh, tyrosine 139 is actually at the position of a heptad repeat and so uh, if this was uh, phosphorylated it would break coiled coiled interactions and then would recruit uh, other uh, SH2 domain containing proteins in there. So um, this eukaryotic uh, invention of the me here may be involved in membrane trafficking. So we have proposed ancient PGRMC1 functions involving steroidogenesis, tyrosinate heme chelation, uh, regulating oxygen consumption and metabolism, and maybe also membrane trafficking uh, is related to the origin of um, eukaryotic membrane. So I also had a look at when the phosphorylated residues of PGRMC1 appeared. This is largely Elizabeth and Mikhail. Um, so, uh, so if we just focus on the cytochrome B5 domain, we've got the coanoflagellate, single cell, cystic group of animals, primitive animals here, uh, and then we've got the placozoans, they, so the C terminus of PGRMC1 gets bigger. In the cnidarians, it gets bigger, and the, the bilaterians, so the, the common ancestor of these, has, has got a, an enlarged PGRMC1 C terminus. It also inherit, inherited tyrosine 139 and tyrosine 180, and they've stayed in all animals subsequent. So uh, those organized, those 
uh, organisms, the common ancestor of Bioteria and Nidaria, which I'm calling the K-Bac, uh, it had the uh, gastrulation organiser. We can see here wind-driven signalling leads to differentiation, in this case of sort of stem cells and, and tentacle-like cells, and in the spearman organiser, it's the, uh, the uh, lays down the body plan and leads to the subsequent differentiation of all those uh, cells via a, a system of CPG methylation, among others. So if we just look what's going on here, uh, this is the animal evolution. So actually hypoxia inducible facts here was uh, acquired by the placozoans. So all of these animals up here have that. Then the organiser was acquired here. And all of these animals have this. So placozoan don't have an organiser, but all the other ones do. And just then once again, and notice that the placozoa is closer to the uh, to Nidarians than other ones. So the organiser then defines a nervous system, has synapses to striated muscle and localised coordinating ganglia, and uh, is this related to oxygen tension and PGMC1, tyrosine 139 and 181. When did all this happen? Um, <clears throat> here is the Ediacaran uh, stratum, which is the first animal fossils. We can see that already we've got annelids, uh, chordates, and things. some of the major groups have already uh, appeared by here. So. Um, between the origin of the K-back and, and this, then, then all of that's gone on. And the different molecular studies sort of say it's around here. The first animal was around here, and this is sort of beyond 700 million years. And this grey box here is what's called the Sturtian glaciation. It was the mother of all snowball events on Earth, 70 million years of a frozen planet, and very low uh, oxygen and low carbon pro productivity. So the origin of animals was associated with uh, an, an oxygen stress level. This is somewhat reflected in uh, modern embryology where we have these uh, glia cells expanding in, in the embryo and they're driven by, uh, by HIF1. Uh, when oxygen comes along and destroys HIF1, uh, it then leads to the differentiation of neurons and uh, embryological HIF1 response is very uncharacteristically uh, independent of Wnt, beta, catenin signaling. So Wnt and, and beta catenin are associated with uh, angiogenesis, not with early embryo embryologists. So once those neurons uh, Develop, then uh, we know that PGRMC1 is involved in axon guidance and the uh, embryonic formation of the central nerve cord. This is conserved from nematodes to mammals and involves uh, interaction with the deleted and colorectal carcinoma family. We also know that PGRMC1 is involved in active synapse function and uh, it's tyrosine phosphorylated only in synaptosome fractions. So that leads us to a hypothesis where uh, PGRMC1 function was affected in eukaryogenesis and once again to play with metabolism it was affected at the time of the Sturtian uh, um, glaciation and this then led to the differential switch between metabolisms which gave rise to the uh, organiser. And the modern function re re functional relevance of that is that PGRMC1 is potentially able to respond to hypoxia and or induce a hypoxic or pseudo-hypoxic state and revert cells to a, an undifferentiated state. So if we go back to more of Bashar's results, uh, he's found that this uh, n methyl nicotin N nicotinamide methyl transferase, NNMT, is uh, high up in, in triple mutant cells. And uh, this enzyme catalyzes this reaction where acetylcyanamethyl methyl is transferred to uh, nicotinamide, and this affects pools of SAM, which are then not available to uh, uh, regulate genomic and histone methylation. So, because of that, we looked at, uh, took a tentative look at uh, epigenetics. And I think this will be the uh, the single most, uh, the, the strongest and most specific mechanism that we'll see today, that we have each of these PGRMC1 mutants takes its particular cell line to a very, very uh, signature place, very far differentiated from other cells. So it clearly re uh, identifies PGRMC1 as a master epigenetic uh, regulator. So um, just to look at one of those types of cell interactions there, uh, we've got the triple mutant versus double mutant, so we're just taking the oxygen acceptor off that tyrosine, and we've got all these you know, hundreds of, cell, of, of, of CBG sites become hypomethylated, and thousands become hypermethylated. So um, if we have a look, then we can see that all of these in, uh, in exons, unprimed translated body, exon boundaries, transcriptional start site, uh, all of these are more methylated in triple mutant. It turns out triple mutant is the most methylated of any of these cells. 
So I was interested where the where, where the hypomethylated sites were, and actually it turns out that they're in cell type of promoter associated enhancer. So in the context of global methylation, we have some uh, cell and, and promoter specific enhancers which are hypomethylated, and of course this is just uh, very reminiscent of uh, in, induced pluripotent pluripotent uh, stem cells where uh, the level of methylation goes up and re resembles those of the human embryonic stem cells. And that, of course, uh, probably resembles the, uh, the state of cells in the KBAC at the stage where this organiser uh, eventuated. So if we look at the GO pathways, then all of this neuros, neuro generation, uh, animal organ de development, uh, organ morphogenesis, all these pathways are saying this is what would happen if we played with something that was re related to organ biology. So we know that pluripotent uh, stem cell pluripotency is uh, affected by one, the NNMT pathway, which globally regulates SAM levels, and two, by PGRMC1, by our catena in P53. Uh, actually, the second paper doesn't quote the first one, but what we're providing is a mechanism where, which uh, connects those. Uh, and uh, interestingly, that's the stem cell system is one where PGRMC1, the cytochrome B5 domain, is extracellular just as in uh, the uh, Alzheimer neurons. So in an Alzheimer's meeting, we should the relevance to to, to uh, or in a neuroscience meeting the relevance to Alzheimer's. This is what, something I presented last year based on uh, Tim Kennedy's group, that uh, netrin signaling in presynaptic uh, activates postsynaptic DCC. Calcium signaling leads to a new AMPA receptor uh, gene transcription. This then enables the cells to respond more uh, positively to subsequent stimulation uh, to remodel the, uh, the postsynaptic spine and lead to stronger uh, synaptic connection and LZP. Uh, notice that membrane is 40% cholesterol. So. Um, in the present, in Alzheimer's, we have this A beta oligomer binds to the Sigma 2 receptor, which I've got somehow putting PGRMC1 in a different non compliant form, and so all of that stuff doesn't happen. So PGRMC1 DCC is, is central in this, in, in my model here. Um, and uh, we've got here the cognition therapeutics drug is coming and affecting this model and then uh, allowing PGRMC1 to then do whatever it does again, and this leads to LTP. So what I would add to that now is that maybe we've got some sort of Warburg or pseudo-hypoxia effect going on here. If this is kind of not absolutely crazy, then we expect uh, to find mitochondrial uh, epigenetics and glucose metabolism defects in Alzheimer's, and we also, all the usual suspects, tau, amyloid, and uh, APOE, should be sort of, that should fit into the model somewhere. So we can look at mitochondria here, uh, and we can say, yes, they're, they're affected epigenetics, absolutely. Um, glycolysis, really important for neurons, and we can see glucose, dysmetabolism, precedes onset. So uh, glucose, absolutely yes. The usual suspects, tau, A, beta, and APOE. So it turns out that APO, in, 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 as a component of a, of a lipoprotein, is responsible for, uh, for clearing cholesterol esters. And when we, we play with that system, you can read in this paper, that we get reduced tau and A, beta pathology. And also from uh, Riyadh et al. last year, that the APOE uh, is probably involved in PGRMC1 uh, LDL receptor trafficking, and I'd also direct you to the talks by Riyadh Katina in today's program. So the story that we've got here is we've got this sort of differentiation going on. Um, PGRMC1 is involved in embryological response. Um, somehow that's perturbed in Alzheimer's, going to the model. Uh, CG1812 then comes in and fixes that up and it restores LTP, so that's what we're talking about. So. Um, if PGRMC1 really is involved in all of this, then have the usual Alzheimer's suspects perhaps blinded us to alternatives, and PGRMC1 could be an uh, omega molecule for, for Alzheimer's and other diseases. So it, having said all of that, um, I'll just leave you with this, that perhaps the question is, uh, could the DCC interaction do this alone, or is freeing up PGRMC1 allowing it to do lots of other stuff in addition to interacting with uh, with TCC. So I'll leave you there. Those are my collaborators, and, and uh, thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. Bye. Thank you, Mike. That was a, a great talk. I'm happy to hear HIF, uh, PGRMC1, and Warburg <laughs> all mentioned in the same talk. Um, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on the relationship between HIF and PGRMC1? I believe you said that. PGRMC1 precedes HIF expression, or could you clarify that? 
Uh, th this is an experiment from a long time ago, but um, you, well, you saw the data, that's all we have. We looked at GLUT1 expression. So what we looked at was GLUT1 and PGRMC1. I can't go any further than that. I don't know any more than that. That experiment happened 12 years ago, something like that. So GLUT1 was induced after PGRMC1. Whether PGRMC1 is also a fifth one induced, I don't know. Thank you. I thought, by the way, that um, our talks were kind of looking through the mirror at all the egos of each other. Other questions? So, Mike, um, it, this is Susan. I was wondering if you could uh, just elaborate a little bit more on the link between the glycolysis and the Speyman organizer. Oh, that's a, um, th there's a whole other aspect of this that I, I didn't kind of have time to unpack there. But uh, if we think that PGRMC1 came from uh, eukaryogenesis, and basically it was a story about uh, what will I eat? the cell thinking, what will I eat? And if I eat this substrate, then I get protected from oxygen. Uh, if, if that's hardwired into the genome, maybe that's what's going on when the organizers, because like an, an organism at this grade, it's only got um, epithelium and endoderm, there's the two, two cell grades. And there's some oxygen thing going on there. And the ability to, to change between those may have given rise to the organized, you be able to switch a cell type on and off rather than have different functions at different places in the cell to actually have two cells doing something else may have given the program that, that the organizer is built on, like a foundation brick. Um, it's, it, there's an, another interesting aspect to this is the, uh, the gut. Um, it was actually, it's the first thing that, that forms in gastrulation, so it's also an organizer product. And um, if we look at the gut, say in the crypt cells of the epithelial cells, then you, you, you've got a, um, a hypoxia in the stem cells down there. And then as they mature and differentiate into the villi epithelium, the, the colonocytes, um, then they, that, that becomes an oxygenated environment. And those cells, it's very important for those cells to be undergoing oxidative phosphorylation to keep the um, the lumen of the gut hypoxic. So that there's a kind of a, a, an interplay going on between the, the colonocytes and, and, and the, it's absolutely, it's Warburg metabolism in the crypt that's happening. And um, the, the, this affects the, the microbiota in the gut and that in turn affects how the gut signals to the brain. And absolutely the microbiota is for instance involved in risk for Alzheimer's disease. So you've got things like uh, GLP-1, PGRMC-1 interacts with GLP-1 receptor, and GLP-1 is one of the things that's released by the gut and goes to the, uh, to the brain and the pancreas to induce insulin and things like that. But um, very big potential for crosstalk there, and all related around this hypoxia axis. So, you know, fascinating area. Thank you, Mike.